um, can we put the cereal back? Oh, no, no, no. I've got it. Hey, good morning. This is an exciting time for us as we look at following Jesus, specifically this summer, because this summer we are in preparation for Cornerstone Carbondale that we have now targeted August 27th, and this is the summer that we get to put all the details together. So the info sheet is still out at the front desk, and next week you will begin to have the opportunity to commit to pray and give and serve as we look at being more present in southern Illinois and offering the gospel to more and more people in our region of the world. This summer is also an exciting time for us as individuals as we launch into this series that we're calling Follow Along. And here's what I know about you. It's also true of me. We want to better follow Jesus. Now, we Hey, let's be honest, we have those Sundays where we're just kind of going through the motions. We have some days where we just want to make it through the day. But what I know about you, what I know about me, is that we want to better follow Jesus and thereby experience the life that God has made possible for us through him. And so every week we're looking at people who dramatically followed Jesus. And as we look at their stories we learn more about our story. And for the summer, we've, we've kind of used Hebrews 12, verse 1 and 2 as our theme passage. And here are the two phrases you need to grab from Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. First of all, we are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses. Meaning, we're not doing this on our own. But our eyes are firmly fixed on Jesus he is the founder, the perfecter, the finisher of our faith. Our hope is solidly placed in him for the joy set before him, and that was our salvation. Jesus endured the cross, despised the shame that would come with it, and is now seated at the right hand of God because he overcame sin and death for us. Our eyes are firmly placed on him, but we don't do it alone. We are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses. We're surrounded by friends and family here today. We're reminded, I'm not alone. And we also get to look in Scripture, our brothers and sisters in faith who trusted God even when it seemed to make no sense. And we are inspired by each other. We are inspired by their stories. That's what we get to do this summer. And the cool part is, as we look to Jesus, we realize we are not the heroes of the story. He is. As we look at these stories of people of faith, we recognize they weren't the heroes either. Sometimes we read the Old Testament and we want to say, oh, I want to be like so-and-so because he was a rock star of faith. No, we find out real quickly the Lord is always the hero of the story. Remember last week's story from Noah? I mean, that dude was chosen by God's grace, not because he was awesome. And shucks, before the end of the story... Noah's a drunk and kind of making a mess of things. God is the hero of the story. And yet, in that story, we get to learn about our faith as well. We're tempted to look at stories like Noah's and think, hey, I wish I could like, be chosen by God and change the world. And yet, the truth of the story of Noah is that the impact of following our Lord is not fully seen to the end. And that's important because once in a while we, we have one of those days and we say, God, where are you? Like, I don't see any fruit. I don't see any reward. I don't see any blessing from following you today. Sometimes we have one of those weeks. Sometimes it's a month. Sometimes it's a year. And we're blessed to be reminded that it was at least 40, probably closer to 100 years before Noah ever saw the impact of him 
obediently following our Lord. Each week we get to learn about following our Lord and the blessing of being obedient to him. So join me today if you have your Bible or Bible app. We're headed to Genesis 12 and I get to introduce you to Abraham and Sarah. Abraham and Sarah. Actually, you probably already recognize their names. It is astounding to realize that Jews, Christians, and Muslims all consider Abraham to be the the father of faith. Like he is the most recognized person of faith in the entire world. Do the math. If you look at Pew Research, if you look at Temple University's research department, they have calculated that over 50% of the world is Jewish, Christian, or Muslim. The most recognized name tied to a person of faith would be Abraham. And so if we're talking about what does it look like to be a person of faith, what does it look like to follow God against all odds, we would be remiss by not looking at the story of Abraham and Sarah. So that's what we're going to do today. So we jump in at Genesis 12. Let me catch you up a little bit. Genesis 11 marks a notable shift in the story accounted for there in Genesis. In the first 11 chapters, or specifically chapters 3 through 11, all of humanity is in one location. The Tower of Babel changes that. Chapters 3 through 11 is about the telling of all of humanity in this one location. Chapter 12 changes that. In chapters 3 through 11, the lifespans are really long. For example, Noah lived 950 years. Those shortened dramatically. Abraham being down at 175, and the lifespans continue to drop. And most importantly is that piece of shifting from the story of all of humanity to the story of one family. And in verse 2 of chapter 12, we find out why. So join me there, Genesis 12, verse 2. And I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. Let's pause for just a second. God clearly kept that promise. He made Abraham's name great. Actually, Abraham's given name was Abram. Sarah's given name was Sarai. So awesome was God's blessing on Abraham and Sarah that he renamed them. And you know them by their renamed names, Abraham and Sarah. He made their name great to where Abraham's name is still celebrated by over 50% of the world's population, like 4 billion people 4,000 years later. Promise number three, you will be a blessing. Number four, I will bless those who bless you. Number five, who dishonors you, I will curse. And the final one, number six, in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. There's the reason. Prior to chapter 12, we're talking about all of humanity. Even though they're in one location, it's about the story of all of humanity. In chapter 12, it's it's all about one family through whom the entire world is going to be blessed. If, if you like numbers and statistics, here's another way to look at it. Chapters 3 through 11 span a period of over 2,000 years. That means every chapter you read, on average, covers 225 years. Beginning in chapter 12, and for the remaining 39 chapters of the book of Genesis, there's about another 250 years, which means the average chapter spans six years. One family much more detailed in the telling of the story. Why? Because now we see the story unfold of God's plan to bless all families in the world. This is an epic story to be told. And and we have the benefit now of looking back and seeing how this played out. We know the story of Abraham and Sarah 
this normal couple who were middle-aged and middle-class, we would call them. I, I mean, Abraham has a wife and a nephew, and that's kind of it. He, he doesn't have this, this empire. He doesn't have a new invention to give to the world. And yet, God's going to do something really dramatic through Abraham and Sarah. We know the story. At 190 years, respectively, they have their first child. His name is Isaac. And through Isaac, God builds a nation. We would soon call them Israel. To Israel, God would give his law. Think Ten Commandments. And to Israel, he would give them a land. Think promised land or Canaan or the nation of Israel. God is using Abraham and Sarah to begin his plan. And remember what I said at the beginning. 50% of the world would say, hey, Abraham is like our hero of faith. Here's where the story is different for our groups of faith. Jesus was born to Mary as an Israelite male. He then lived under the law, perfectly obeying the law. Today, the Jews are still waiting for a Savior. The Muslims believe there was another word that was even more important than Jesus, the word. Jesus lived perfectly then went to the cross to die sacrificially in our place. Jesus perfectly lived by the Lord, by the, excuse me, the law, and thereby secured righteousness on our behalf. He went to the cross, and on the cross, God punished Jesus for our sins. Jesus, the only one who was worthy to go to the cross, then became the sacrificial payment from God, by God, for our sins. And so when Jews and Muslims would say, hey, like what's the big deal about Jesus anyway? We would say one word, resurrection. Resurrection. Because on Sunday morning, Jesus left the tomb empty. And what we have in our hands, we'd call it the New Testament, we have books that account for the resurrection of Jesus, that document the account of Jesus' resurrection, that were written within 20 years of Jesus' resurrection, referring to the story, the account, the testimonies of those who saw Jesus resurrected. And they're saying, hey, if you don't believe me, just go down to Jerusalem. There are still people alive who saw Jesus alive. We have in our hands clear documentation that Jesus truly did rise from the dead. And he left the tomb empty. We know the story. We know how God's promise to Abraham was fulfilled in Jesus. That is the gospel. And what you find in the story of Abraham is that when God said to him, Hey, Abraham, through you I'm going to bless all nations. Hey, Abraham, through you your descendants will be like the sands of the seashore and the stars of the sky. Abraham believed God, and God credited it to him as righteousness. And because of Abraham's faith, he obeyed God. Now, in verse 1 of chapter 12, we get to see how Abraham obeyed God. Verse 1, now the Lord said to Abram, remember that was his given name, go from your country and your kindred, and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And when we look at this, we see three aspects of life that God said to Abraham, I want you to surrender these to me. Your land, your kindred, and your father's house. So, so what, what, what are these three? What did that look like for Abram? Abram grew up in 
modern-day Iraq, almost down to the Persian Gulf. He then moved with his dad up to a place called Haran. And in Haran, his father passed away. And then moving from Haran, he moved down to modern-day Israel. And what God was saying to Abraham is, don't cling to the place you live. I'm going to ask you to surrender what you would call home. The second thing, he he says to Abram, I need you to surrender your kindred. That simply means family, both immediate and extended. Abraham, you, you can't cling to the people you call family or you'll miss following me. An interesting thing about Abraham's story is that he took one family member with him, and that family member made a mess of his life. The family member was Lot. And and let me be really straight. You and I wouldn't blame Abraham for taking Lot with him because while they were in Haran, Lot's dad, brother to Abraham, died. Also, grandfather, Abraham, and Lot's dad's dad was dead. So Lot had nobody. He, he had no family. And so you and I wouldn't blame Abraham for saying, hey, Lot, you can come along. But the interesting thing in the story is that Lot kept making a mess of Abraham's life. When they moved to the promised land, the shepherds of Lot were battling with the shepherds of Abraham because there wasn't enough grass for all of the animals. Then it, it was Sodom and Gomorrah that Lot moved to, and God uh, used Abraham to plead for the salvation of Sodom and Gomorrah. Mostly, Abraham was pleading for Lot's life. And then, Lot becomes a prisoner of war when the five kings fight the four kings. And it just, here's Abraham going after Lot to save him from this war. So the Bible never says specifically That Abraham disobeyed by taking Lot along, but Lot made a mess of things. Abraham didn't leave his family. And then finally, God says to Abraham, I need you to leave your father's house. Now, the phrase here is important to talk about just for a moment because they didn't have houses. They were nomads. They traveled from region to region, kind of pick up, move, and wherever the animals were, wherever the crops were, to provide for their animals. This phrase that's translated father's house means the the trappings, your household goods. Because here's how it would be. Even though they moved from location to location to location, they still had the same tent. They still had the same water pot. They still had the same rug. it's, It's how you can move to a new house And after you put your couch in there and your decorations up and and the utensils and the normal stuff you've always had, it quickly feels like home. And God said to Abraham, hey, don't cling to the stuff that makes you feel like you're at home or you'll miss following me. What's interesting is Jesus affirms these same distractions when it comes to us following him. One guy said to Jesus, hey, Jesus, like I'm going to follow you to whatever place you may go. And Jesus, speaking of himself, said this, the son of man doesn't even have a place to lay his head. If you and I are not careful, we'll become place distracted. There are some of you who have said, hey, God, I'll serve you in whatever way you ask me to but I don't want to move from southern Illinois. This is home. Others of you have said, hey, God, I will follow you wherever you want me to go as long as it has a lot of sun or sand or a mountain or a beach. We have kind of that wanderlust. And God has said to some of us, stay. You see, we can be distracted by a place. Also, We can be distracted by people. Jesus said, unless you hate father, mother, sister, brother, spouse, even your own life, you cannot be a follower of mine. 
What happens is we get distracted by people. We get distracted by what we think people think about us, and in so doing, miss where Jesus is leading us. There are some of you right now that the direction of your life is more determined by the people whose perception you are seeking than the Lord you are serving. There are some of you who are in a relationship, might be a friend, might be a boyfriend or girlfriend, and that person is more directing you than the person who died for you. Beware. Beware. Because we, just like Abraham, can miss following our Lord because of the people we want around us. And then just as God said to Abram, hey, you got to leave your father's house. When Jesus started his public ministry, he said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he immediately went and started inviting fishermen to leave their careers to follow Jesus as Lord. There are some of us who are currently distracted by what we assume we need to be doing with our lives. And lo and behold, Jesus is asking us to follow him with our lives. And we can just get so caught up, not not just with sinful things, just distractions that keep us from following the one who has invited us to experience life to the fullest. Beware of things you assume you need to take with you. They may be holding you back. For Abraham and Sarah, they heard the voice of God and they responded with obedience. They did move. They did obey. They did follow in such a way that we're still talking about them. We're still celebrating what God did through them. And so it is no wonder that when we get to Hebrews chapter 11, the hall of faith, the celebration of people that God used in dramatic ways, Abraham and Sarah are both in there. Hebrews 11 verse 8 says this about Abraham. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place looking forward to the city that has foundation, whose designer and builder is God. Abraham wasn't looking to build his career, his dynasty, his empire, his notable accomplishment. His desire was to be a part of this city that God had designed and was building. He simply wanted to be a part of what God was doing, and he followed obediently, even when it didn't make sense. Even when he had no concept or construct to understand how God was going to raise up a nation through whom he would ultimately send Jesus. But Abraham took God at his word. Sarah, verse 11, by faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive even when she was past the age since she considered him faithful who had promised Now, Abraham and Sarah lived longer than you and I will. But Sarah knew her body. Sarah knew that in her 80s, the chance of her overcoming infertility was gone. She understood the normal cycles that a woman had, and she was not having them anymore. By faith, When God promised that she would conceive a child with Abraham, she believed. She believed him and miraculously conceived a child, a woman who had been barren her entire life when it was physically possible for her to have a baby, miraculously conceived a child past childbearing years and gave birth to little Isaac at age 90. What a miracle from God. And you can see right here, Sarah's faith was in her God. Where is your faith? 
Where is your faith? Is, is your faith in our justice system? That that person did, who did you wrong is going to get what's coming to them because we have the best courts in the, in the land? Is your faith in karma? Like, man, if I just keep doing good stuff, surely it'll bounce back and hit me in the face one of these days. Is your faith specifically in other people? Is, is your faith in the economy? Is, where is your faith? Abraham and Sarah place their faith in the one who is faithful. For some of us, our faith is in ourselves. Have you, have you heard us as Americans say, he pulled himself up by his bootstraps. She is a self made woman. I'm telling you what, it's a good thing that Abraham and Sarah did not place their faith in themselves because they blew it. They blew it. Sarah. She knew God told Abraham that Abraham would have a son. And after the years went by and she still wasn't able to conceive, she went to her husband and said, Honey, I know God promised you a child and it is clear I'm not the one to be able to pull that off. So I give you my servant, Hagar. You may have relations with her and conceive the child that God has promised you because I'm just too broken. And I think you can probably guess that kind of made a mess. And then later, when God specifically said to Abraham, Abraham, I'm telling you what, my promise is for you and Sarah. You and Sarah, yes, late in years, will conceive a child. And it will be one year from now, I'll come back and you'll have a baby. And Sarah laughed. (laughs) What? It's a good thing Sarah did not place her faith in her obedience, in her purity of faith, because she had days of doubt, and she had days that she tried to take matters into her own hands, and it got messy fast. Same way for Abraham. Though we, half the population of the world, say, man, there's not a a better man of faith than Abraham, he had some of those days just like you and I do. And so when Sarah came to him and said, hey, God promised it to you. Obviously, I'm too broken to conceive a child with you. Hey, here's Hagar. Though God did not lead him to do that, to conceive a child with another woman. He did. And then, much worse than Sarah's lack of faith, Abraham didn't believe God on some days. God said to Abraham, the people who bless you, I will bless. The people who curse you, I will curse. Abraham, know this. I got your back. It's going to be just fine. You don't have to worry about anything. I got your back. You can trust me, I am faithful. And the very next passage here in Genesis chapter 12 tells the story of Abraham not believing God. When they traveled down to Egypt, Abraham was scared for his life. And so he says to his wife, Hey, honey, you're hot. Um, So ladies, I'm just warning you, if your husbands start off with that line, you may just kind of wonder where this thing's going. (laughs) Husbands, if you start with that line, don't finish it like Abraham did. Here's how Abraham finishes it. Honey, you're so hot. The king of Egypt will want you. And he'll kill me to get you. So to save my skin, when we go into Egypt, tell them that you are just my sister. That is about the most unromantic thing you could ever say to your wife. I mean, that's just pathetic. Here God said, Abraham, 
Man, I got your back. I promise you, I am faithful. You can trust me. If they curse you, I will take them out. And the very next step that Abraham takes in leading his family is a pathetic, wimpy, trying to save his own skin and telling his wife to pose just as his sister. Disgusting. And the sad truth of it is, he makes the same make mistake later. And what's really bizarre is that the next time he does it, when they're going into the region where Gerar is king, Sarah is well into her 80s. And he says to her, hey, honey, you're so hot. And she's got to be thinking, I'm 80 years old. I'm starting to sag. You know, I, what, what, really? Like the king's going to hunt me down to put me in his harem? And I mean, can you imagine how disappointing that as a wife would be? For your husband to say, hey, I am so willing to protect myself, I don't care what happens to you. Disgusting. It's a good thing Abraham and Sarah's faith was not in their obedience. Their faith was in God. They were declaring with both words and actions, my God is faithful. My God is faithful. Say that with me. My God is faithful. Even when you, like Abraham, are scared for your life, you can say, say it with me, my God is faithful. Even when you, like Sarah, feel broken, And as if this brokenness will never end, you can say, my God is faithful. Even when you feel all alone, you can declare, my God is faithful. Even when you blow it again and fall right back into sin, you can declare, my God is faithful. There's our hope. There's our hope. It's sure not in you because you'll screw up again. It's sure not in the people around you because they'll disappoint you again. It's it's sure not that American dream because it will falter again. But this is true. My God is faithful. My God is faithful. Even when I don't understand, even when I feel broken, even when I feel alone, even when I don't understand why, my God is faithful. And you can declare that this week. And the beauty of our worship opportunity here this morning is that we get to declare that my God is faithful as we take communion together. As we celebrate that God was faithful to his promise to Abraham to bring salvation to all peoples and he did it through Jesus. That God is faithful to keep his word. That all the families would be blessed because Jesus would go to the cross and take our sin that we could confess Jesus is Lord and experience salvation through him. Our God is faithful. And today you're invited in worship. Today you're invited in communion. Today you're invited in declaration to make the statement, my God is faithful.